Good afternoon, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about medieval leaf and what we have found so far. So, uh, the excavations started uh, as part of the Edinburgh Trams project, and they started in July 2020 once the COVID restrictions started to uplift. So there were several restrictions that we have to follow. They were, the excavations were located in Constitution Street in the former graveyard of South Louis Parish Church Church, which was formerly known as St. Mary's Kirk. Previous excavations done by Headland in 2009 revealed that actually the boundary wall of the church, the graveyard, ran uh, overflow towards the east. So they knew, we knew uh, beforehand that there will be graves there. So the excavation revealed a total of 385 skeletons and a very high number of disarticulated bone. We have these size boxes, 90 of them in storage at the moment. Uh, that is uh, kind of like to give you an idea of how the, the graveyard and the graves were distributed. So the usual burial types that we uncover will be like a single individual in a supine position, so the face looking up, uh, extended, and with the head to the west and the feet to the east, which is the normal Christian tradition. Uh, there were others that were found in group burials, as that photo to the right, which is uh, an adult and a, and a child, but there were also some mass burial pits. Uh, the biggest one, we recovered at least 20 individuals from it. But as always, there are exceptions to the rule. Um, that one, closest to me, it was found uh, in a ditch which measured 10 meters across. It was around the center of the site. And as you can see from the photo, it was flexed and with the face down, so in a prone uh, position. The, its head was to the east instead of to the west, and the feet to the, obviously to the west. The, the other burial that I'm showing there, uh, you probably cannot see, but uh, if you notice the knees, they were flexed, so they were higher up, the, head, the hands like this, and this one also had the head to the east and the feet to the west, which it may indicate that they were part of the clergy, as the Christian tradition is that the congregation of the flock will be with the head to the west, and when the final judgment day comes, they will rise, and the priest had to be facing the congregation, its flock, to guide them through. Once the excavation was completed, uh, uh, it was decided to do a preliminary study. The main, there were two aims to this study. Uh, one was to identify the chronology, when was the graveyard used, and uh, if possible, even to see how it extended over time. And the other aim of these studies was to see if certain uh, studies that they were not done in the previous 2009 excavation were possible, were suitable or viable. And that was uh, specifically for the parasite analysis. So the studies that they were conducted uh, as part of these preliminary studies, which is the ones that we are going to be talking about, uh, were radiocarbon dating, parasite analysis, facial reconstruction, and some fines conservation. So uh, a total of 10 skeletons were selected for radiocarbon dating. They were, when we were selecting them, we were trying to get them ac across the whole uh, graveyard, but also we did get few from uh, the mass burial pits, and uh, another one which he had during excavation shown a very, very interesting pathology. Uh, the oldest one is that one, which you probably cannot see, but it says, believe me, 1295. So it's the late 13th century. Most of the dates were in the middle of 15th century, but they ran towards the early 16th century. 
the, that earliest date is actually from, like in terms of location, it's kind of like towards the center of where the graveyard was. The parasite analysis, we sent a total of 59 samples uh, from 36 skeletons. They included the, a sample from the pelvis, uh, if, if we could, uh, particularly from the sacrum, so abdominal area, and some extra as uh, control samples. Those control samples were collected from underneath the skull. And the parasite analysis was done uh, in Oxford University, and they, they give us very interesting results. So 10 samples contained at least one type of parasite. The, I'm not a parasite expert, so stay with me. But it's like there were at least three types. Two of those will be uh, from soil to body, and after the other one is a parasite that is uh, associated with eating undercooked or raw beef or pork. Further, is, is, if it's possible, the specialist has said that if they do further study, the molecular, uh, at molecular level, they can even pinpoint if it's beef or pork, which could be quite interesting, I think. So, uh, aye. So 10 samples contain one type of parasite, two contain more than one type of parasite, and one contain all three types. So it was eating raw food or not very well cooked, and it probably wasn't cleaning his or her hands after going to the toilet. That's what it means. Uh, facial reconstruction was uh, completed by Dundee University master students, <laughs> and we did have struggle with that as well because of the preservation. So, as you can see, it's like the, with overflown graveyard, they will be cutting each other, but not only cutting each other in terms of graves, but also with all these modern services. So to find a nice, complete skull was a challenge, but we did. And we, we have 16 skulls selected, and we were really lucky, and you will see when Lauren is talking, but one of the very interesting pathologies actually had a complete skeleton. We did, all, they also completed um, an illustration of uh, this, some pathological, la, 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 disarticulated bones. It is very, yeah, I get excited about it. Hi, so uh, my name is Lauren, and I'm part of the field team for the Edinburgh Trams project. I'm just going to talk you through a bit about the post-excavation that we're doing just now. So the post-excavation, we haven't finished it yet, but it will be ongoing uh, within the next couple of months. So everything I'm going to talk about today is just from our initial assessments. So our aim for the post-excavation is to build a picture of life and death in medieval leaf. So can we tell the profession, health, social status, or the cost of death of the individuals in this population? So we can investigate this in many different ways. So we've got our initial skeletal assessment that we'll do, but we've also got some specialist studies that will be done out with guard archaeology um, by specialists in the field. So we've got ancient DNA studies, and this will identify individual traits such as eye and hair colour, and also population genetic influences. And then we've got parasite analysis, which Araya has already spoken about, and isotope analysis. So that's the one that you're probably most common, uh, commonly known about, and this would be strontium to determine the country of origin and carbon and nitrogen to determine diet. I'm just going to go through a few really interesting case studies. So these are just interesting burials that we got from the graveyard in Leith. So this one here is SK232, and the carbon-14 date on this one puts it at about 1458 as a date of interment. And we think from our initial studies, this is a young adult female, around 20 to 35 years old, and it's part of a group burial with four other individuals. As you can see there, if you look just under the arm, there is another individual poking through, so they would have been buried within the same uh, grave cut, just one on top of each other. And we think with this one, as you've probably seen from the photo, that we have probable blunt force trauma to the head, so to the frontal bone. And this looks like it's been cleaned via surgical intervention. And we've also got the presence of two well-healed lesions on the side of the, the frontal bone there, which is probably trepanation. And this was likely to relieve or drain the larger wound as it healed. Um, and that's really interesting because the bone healing suggests that medical care would have been given to this individual and they would have survived for at least a few months after having that injury to heal that bone. And the probable causes of this, there could be many, and we're not too sure what it is yet, 
but it's, it could be a work-related incident. As we know, that Leith is on the water, so it could be a shipyard or a dockyard incident, or also interpersonal violence. So here's just a close-up of that skull. So you can see on the left here, uh, the possible blunt force trauma, which has caused frontal collapse and radial fracture out from that initial wound, which looks like it has been su surgically cleaned. And you can tell that because of the rounded edges on that larger wound in the middle there. And then also you can see sort of on the side there, the presence of the trepanation holes. And this looks like it might have been drilling or incision as the method for that. Um, but that's something that we'll look into more when we do our post X. And here's a facial reconstruction. So this was done by the University of Dundee, but it just shows you the extent of that wound and to have uh, survived that wound in the 15th century. So SK232 indicates a high level of surgical skill in the 15th century, as we talked about before there. Um, an analysis of this one, uh, this skeleton, and the rest of the population will investigate this trend and see if that's something that we can see across the population or if it's just specific to this individual. So now we're moving on to case study two. So this is SK130, which is, from our initial assessments, a probable older adult male. And they present with multiple heel traumatic injuries. So they've got bone breaks of the right ulna, which is the lower arm, the right pelvis, and one rib. And this is likely sustained from one traumatic event, such as a possible fall from height. And you can't really see it here, um, but that's, we can tell that it's a possible fall from height because of breakages being on one side of the body, and then also that really severe pelvic injury on the same side as well. So is this evidence of medical care? We think it might be, because the ulna has been set and the pelvis is also well healed. So it'd be interesting when we get the carbon-14 for this individual um, to see does the level of care match what we know of this time period. So here's just a close-up of that ulna. You can see sort of in, on the right there in the middle, there's a little bit of a healing scar, but it has healed pretty well, and it looks like someone has splinted the bone, so the lower arm, um, to make sure that it healed straight. And here's the pelvis. So apart from that bony spur that you can see on the right-hand side there in the middle of the pelvis, all you can see is a little bit of a fracture line that has healed. Um, and if anyone is familiar with pelvic injuries, they're quite difficult and long to heal. So this person would have been able, wouldn't have been able to take care of themselves, and they probably would have been bedridden. Um, so that is evidence of medical care in the community um, to take care of this individual. So these case studies just pose really interesting questions um, that we will look at in our post X, such as, was med medical care widespread in this population? Were the individuals cared for during injury and illness? As we can see from the case studies, they probably were. And how advanced was the level of medical care in this period? Um, but only during the post X will be able to tell us that. So hopefully we'll be able to come back to you in a few years time and let you know what we find. And I'll just hand back to Araya. Uh, so, comparing to the results that they were done previously by Headland, you can see that the dating is similar to, to what the, the results that they got. We will be doing more dating once uh, post-excavation starts, and hopefully getting uh, more on those interesting cases. Uh, the burials are similar to other Christian burials, and in the manner of internment and how they are, but it will be also interesting to see what, where these two uh, slightly you know, different orientation lay in terms of period, and maybe even you know, with the later the studies that they come, the isotope studies, if they are different origin, different they come from somewhere else, or what the story. The, so the completion of the post-excavation study will give us a more complete picture of how the population was at the time. It's giving us an, an opportunity to use techniques that they were not used in the past, that is not be is because they are getting more available and they are out there, so you are starting to think about it, and it's, it's a great opportunity to have these different specialists and different involved in the same study, different brains. Okay. Um, so parasite, isotope, ancient DNA could definitely answer questions that are often being left unanswered. Uh, we often find that the post-excavation alone of uh, post-excavation, I mean the skeletal analysis, for instance, we do have some hurdles with trying to sex children, so it will be interesting to see what uh, ancient DNA can give us in the respect of that. or. Uh, as often we find with when analyzing skeletons, you do find 
there are a lot of diseases that we don't know. It's just uh, you don't know the cause of death of that particular person. They just survive. They are survivors. But there are a lot of diseases that will not leave a trait on the bone. So it will be interesting to see in that from the ancient DNA studies. So uh, conclusion, the, as I say, the in interdisciplinary approach uh, will offer an opportunity to use and integrate new scientific techniques. Uh, they are available up there, but they, we may not have been used before. Um, and they do offer a uh, potential to answer those questions. I think that and hopefully you call us back again in a few years' time when we can share the results, although I do think that probably we will get some answers, but we will get further questions, as always the case. So thank you very much for listening.